This is Access Tech Live. And we're back on Access Tech Live. Well, let's dive into some of the headlines this week that we've been talking about. And of course, accessible travel is something that we all aim for, we all hope for. We hope our experience traveling is a good one as disabled people. But this mark, uh, this week mark, there's been one particular example yet again of uh, travel making life inaccessible for people. Yeah. I feel like we take steps forward like that, you know, report from WestJet is an incredible commitment and it's great to see a company taking the initiative and actually putting yeah. out tools and inter in inserting policy. Then I go on LinkedIn and I, and I see a, a tweet or a LinkedIn post from Dave Dame, of course, one of the directors of accessibility for hardware at Microsoft. And he was traveling and he wrote this, disappointed, frustrated and angry. My work trip was ruined due to the carelessness of the crew uh, for at Logan Airport. They carried my power wheelchair seat with one hand while juggling other suitcases, ultimately breaking it. Their attempt to save time cost me three days of obligations. It's not about being disabled. It's about the impact of individual carelessness. Uh, too many nesses. Uh, Air Canada was doing better, but one employee ruined the progress. You know, I feel sometimes, Stephen, like we're almost a pirate sometimes trying to repeat this. And unfortunately, it's because more stories come out like this. And as much work as any airline can do, whether it's Air Canada, WestJet, whatever, unfortunately, sometimes it comes down to, in this case, a single employee who's just not doing something or doing something for whatever reason they, they deem necessary. And, and the ripple effect is just, it's debilitating. And I, I, it's just, it, it blows my mind that it's still happening. You know, I told you a story, we were talking about this on the air, off the air before, that I was traveling to Toronto in one of these smaller jets, and I, I had a road case with me with all the really expensive equipment that I couldn't, you know, risk breaking, okay? And I get to the door, and they're like, yeah, you're going to have to check that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not checking this. Like, if I check this, and this something happens to it, then that's five days of broadcast that aren't going to happen. And they were hesitating, and I said, listen, I'm bringing it on the plane, or, uh, or we're going to have to figure this out some other way. Because I looked outside the window, and the way they get it down to the tarmac is a giant slide. There's no way that's not going to get broken on the way down. So the fact that these are still practices that happen, blow my mind. And the fact that they do this with wheelchairs. You know, it, it, there's talk of you know tagging these devices so that people know they're fragile. It's a wheelchair. I mean, th don't you understand what this is? What this is for? This is literally someone's ability to move around, and you're treating it as if it is worthless. And therefore, in my mind, you're treating the individual who's in that wheelchair as useless, as not worthy, as irrelevant. And this is the problem we face time and time again. We face this as I face it many times with assistance on particularly airports and, and air travel. You, you, my friend Sean Priest, who does Double Tap with me, he often refers to traveling as being passed around like a parcel. And that's exactly what it is. We are luggage to some of these people. You know, for example, when I go to an airport, I am trying more and more these days to do this as independently as I can without the need for assistance. Yeah. Because, you know, if I go to an airport and when we did our recent travels, you know, I didn't want to go straight to the gate two hours before my flight is due to go. You know, I don't want to sit just at a gate. I want to go shopping. I want to go for a meal. I want to do all the things that you would do, anybody would do if you go to an airport. You go to the airport early, you get checked in, you get your baggage away, you get your luggage tent, you know, off checked in, and then you head off on your holidays and you have a great time at the airport. But you can't do that if you're disabled. You are kind of taken into this little area. You're parked over here somewhere. Oftentimes you're asked, as, as I am as a blind person, to get into a wheelchair that I don't need to travel through an airport to go straight to the gate to sit there for two hours while I'm waiting for you know someone to take me onto the plane. It's not a fun experience. Travel is not fun in that regard. And this is something that happens time and time again. I have a friend who was on a train. Uh, this person was in a wheelchair and is in a wheelchair. And when the train arrived at its destination, they were left on the train. There was no one turned up with a ramp. They couldn't get off the train. The train then headed back to the depot with that person still on it, screaming, banging on the window, saying, hello, can anyone see me? Can anybody help me get off this train? He ended up back at the depot and then had to explain to a bunch of guys in boiler suits who were there to you know, fix the train, I guess, or clean it or do whatever they were going to do with it. And they're wondering, why is this person on the train? And, you know, the amount of hassle it causes, the amount of uh, you know, impact it has. You know, Dave said it lost three days of, of work. This is a huge impact on individuals, an impact on our lives and, and potentially our careers. You know, of course, a company like Microsoft and no company is going to blame Dave or anyone else for, for this kind of thing. But, you know, 
we as disabled people often have imposter syndrome anyway, right? We always feel less than because we're often treated less than. This yeah. kind of thing doesn't help. No, I mean, I, you know, I had this conversation with someone and I, I tried to give them some perspective. I said, imagine someone was just hired at a company and, and they have to fly somewhere and they use a wheelchair and they have to fly somewhere to finalize a multi-million dollar deal. 17 people are coming in from different countries. And because of a careless, you know, carelessness of someone at an airport, the wheelchair is broken, those meetings are gone, and that deal is lost and that costs the company millions of dollars. Yes, of course, you're not going to blame the individual because it's not their fault. But can you imagine the feeling of that person going, I can't believe I just did this. I just started this job. What's going to happen? And while, you know, companies aren't discriminating, you can imagine what's going through someone's head time and time again going, I can't believe I still have to deal with that. And I'm curious from your perspective what you think. And I, there's no there's no answer here. There's no black or white. What is it, what is it going to take to, to get this off our radar like these should just shouldn't be happening anymore what can we do other than tell these stories and hopefully make people aware of what's going on to to solve it is there a solve here i don't know if there is i, I honestly don't yeah. know because you know and i don't want to be negative about it because obviously i see progress and there is clearly progress in some regards it comes from the top down. It's about the airlines. It's about the companies. You know, for people who, for example, go to a restaurant and they have a guide dog and they're told they can't come into the restaurant, those access refusals still go on to this day. Numerous times someone tries to get into a taxi, they're told they can't because of their dog. You know, in the UK, for example, that's against the law, right? But it doesn't matter. It's still happening all the time. How do you fix it? I don't know. And do we really want to start jailing people over this? I guess we have to do something, right? Because clearly the law isn't working, clearly the rules aren't getting through, and we are still seen as less than people. In fact, you know, and, and I often go back to this point, and I've had this many times from my own experience, when I get into a car or a taxi or, you know, wherever I'm going, and I tell someone I'm traveling for work, they seem surprised. You've got a job? You work? Uh, th that is still the level we're at as disabled people in 2024. So yes, huge progress has happened. Lots of companies love to talk about what they do to improve accessibility. Global Accessibility Awareness Day has become that mouthpiece for companies to say, look how great we are with disabled people. And then you see an example like Dave's experience this week, which is not alone. He's not alone in this. But you know, you're right. This has a huge impact on him. But also the cost. I mean, these, these wheelchairs are not cheap. It costs a huge amount of money. You can't just yeah. replace it on a whim. You can't just stick another one on the credit card. That's not possible. Even if you wanted to, you've got to wait for it to be built and delivered to you. He can't afford that kind of time, and nor he should have to. So, you know, I don't know what the solution to this is, but, you know, the good thing is we're talking about it, and that, I guess, is the most important part of this. You know, I think it's important for people to tell us um, both sides of the story, too. I, I, there are a lot of people I know that actually tell positive stories about the experiences they've had. And yeah, it's absolutely. good to balance out to hear both sides because there are, you know, you can't point a finger at a particular company or a particular, sometimes you can point a finger at an individual, you know, if it happens, but, you know, one person's at fault. But a lot of work is being done and we can't ignore that fact. But yeah, I think I think more, more and more needs to be done in order to, to make this happen, which is kind of interesting. Um, Uber caregiver, part of the Uber Uber Health app. I wanted to just touch upon this for a couple of seconds, even because I thought it was a Uber kind of branches their arms out into different places, and it's cool to see them use a service that they have at their core, which is basically people just driving places, um, bringing it to a, a cool new light and making it a little bit easier for people to use the service to rely on things for deliveries and to help someone actually manage it with you. I, I can imagine the use cases myself with just people that I work with and people that I live with on a daily basis to be able to call rides for them, manage and track deliveries and stuff like that. I thought that was a pretty cool initiative, especially working with healthcare to make sure they have a cut covers on the cost. Yeah, I love this idea because, you know, I think for me, what I've often felt is there needs to be almost, and I feel this with assistance at airports as well when we talk about that, you know, there needs to be like a pro version of all of this stuff. Like I was yeah. saying earlier, you know, if I go to the airport and I want to have a wander around, go to a restaurant, you know, it's finding the restaurant, it's finding the stores, finding what's in the stores. I'll pay money to have someone come with me through the airport and you know take me around to where I want to go. I want that autonomy. I want a bit more control over that rather than it being something that's a service that's given to me as a disabled yeah. person. If I can afford it, I will, and it should be available to more people, ideally for free, but you know, we may have to put our hands in our pockets. Uber Caregiver to me sounds a little bit like this. You know, I think about things like prescriptions, getting access to medical appointments, where you need to be somewhere on time. And also, you want to be able to get back from that. You know, a taxi is great to take you, for example, from one place to another, but ideally you want to 
ideally have that same person with you to bring you back. Maybe they could wait with you. These are great services. There's an example of this in the UK called Driving Miss Daisy, uh, which is very similar to this. And, you know, we don't have Uber Caregiver in the UK yet. Hopefully we will down the line. But, you know, it's great to see these kind of services be available and also give us a bit more autonomy in our lives, a bit more independence, a bit more control over what we do with our money and also what we get from our services. I love that it's a good option, alternative to some of the government-funded stuff like adaptive transport, et cetera, et cetera, giving yeah. you a choice. It's not like you're relying on just one service, which is uh, pretty cool. I look forward to it coming to the UK. Maybe you can tech check it out and tell me how it works. Uh, coming up, can artificial intelligence have emotions? I don't know if that's scary or that's good, Stephen, uh, but you cut off with the founder <laughs> of a company who thinks that it can. Stick around for Hume AI. Hume AI.